so today I'll be talking about the work that we've been doing at the Institute for Applied Economic Research, uh, focusing mostly on transport and inequalities and access to opportunities. Uh, and I will, I will try to have a very brief presentation because I know a lot of the stuff that we get from brown bag seminars is in the Q&A session. Uh, so I'll briefly talk about two different uh, topics here. The first one will, it will be a little bit lengthier. I'll be talking about the Access to Opportunities project. Uh, this will be the core of my presentation. This is a project that we've been carrying out in, in Brazil for about two years now, and we're heading to, um, to a, to a long-term project that should be up until 2025 at least. And the project is, as you will see, is relatively large and ambitious. And along the way, we have to develop a lot of tools and techniques to do the data analysis that we want to do in the project. So in the, at the end of, the, of my presentation, I'll be also pointing very briefly some of the new tools that we've been developing along the way to uh, pursue the project that we are developing. So let's start with the Access to Opportunities project. This is a, it's kind of a spin-off from my uh, PhD uh, I finished in 2018. And the project has, as a starting point, a very basic difference between two important concepts in human geography and transport geography, which is the difference between mobility and accessibility. I know a lot of you are familiar with these two concepts and how they differ, but I, I think for the sake of uh, leveling up the, uh, the, the knowledge, there might be some undergrad students who will be uh, watching this video. I'd like to make clear the distinction between, between them. So when we talk about mobility, we usually use this term to refer to some to daily travel behavior. So what time people leave their home, what transport mode they use, how many trips they made, uh, how, many, how much time they spent in, in traffic, and so on. So this is what people in transportation studies call travel behavior, the actual trips that people take on a daily basis. Accessibility, on the, on the other hand, is a long, long lasting, long uh, term crucial concept in human geography and, and transport studies. And it's not so much about the behavior of what trips people take, but it's more about how easily they could reach uh, opportunities that are spread across space or sometimes even virtually. So it's how easily you can move around uh, either physically or virtually and to, uh, to access different potential, uh, different activities like uh, healthcare services, jobs, um, uh, health facilities and, and schools, for example. So it's not so much about the actual travel behavior, it's about the potentiality, how easily people could move and reach stuff. Uh, to make this two uh, concepts very clear, I like to bring this two uh, photographs here. So the photo on the left shows you a piece of the city of Rio de Janeiro in, in, in the neighborhood named Barra da Tijuca. And as you can see in this picture, you have like a few very wide uh, roads with a lot of traffic with, in high speed, uh, but you have very low density and very low mix uh, land use. So if you were a pedestrian in the, in, the, uh, in the pavement or in the sidewalk near there, you would have very hard time in reaching like a, the closest school or the closest health healthcare facility or even the basic uh, grocery store, for example. You have an immense number of cars and vehicles moving around very quickly but your ability to access services and places is, is very much diminished. The photo on the right-hand side, however, is a very contrasting place. It, this is the city center of Rio, but this could be the city center of pretty much any mid-sized large city in Brazil. I have, uh, you usually have some public transport and private transport going in and out, but you also have so much higher density of, of uh, housing and economic activities that a pedestrian even in 15 minutes could easily walk around and reach a very wide number of opportunities of services and, and economic activities. So I think these two uh, pictures, they, they encapsulate very well this difference between uh, places and how we built our cities in different ways and in the sense that some parts of the city might have very high intensity volume and speed, but not necessarily access to opportunities. And in, in some other parts, you, by different compositions of how the building environment is created, we have a, a more a balanced uh, 
between uh, speed and access uh, in, in that sense. So the Access to Opportunities project uh, starts from this basic differentiation between mobility and accessibility. And we have three aims with the project. Uh, we want to generate annual estimates of access to employment, healthcare facilities, and schools by transport mode in Brazil's largest urban areas by, uh, at, the, at, the, at the city, at the block level. So in Brazil, we talk a lot about mobility. We have a lot of uh, people working with GPS data, mobile phone data, household travel surveys but we have very few people paying attention uh, into uh, accessibility issues. The second aim that we want to uh, get uh, with this project is to get all the data that we produce of the project and share them openly, not only the data outputs, but also the code to make the project at least to some extent reproducible and uh, make the code more accessible to a wider audience with interactive data, data visualizations as well. And ultimately, what we really want to do is to move the needle just a bit and change how uh, policy and planning and uh, policy and planning is done in Brazil. So we're trying to, we're collaborating actually with the Ministry of, of Cities in Brazil, the federal government, the people who have the funding to, uh, to finance uh, public transport investments. And we're trying to, in, to uh, include the idea of access to opportunities and using accessibility to evaluate the impact assessment of this transportation projects and investments. So what is the scope of the project? So we started in 2019 and the idea is that we will have a, a one round to estimate the a snapshot of the accessibility conditions of every of the largest cities in Brazil once a year. Uh, we've done this in 2019. This year in 2020, we are doing again 2017 and 18, we're looking back uh, a bit trying to build a, a, a historical uh, trend. And we are hoping we'll be able to do this up until 2022, maybe even 2025. So we are looking at access to uh, low education, mid-education and higher education jobs, healthcare facilities of uh, low, middle and high complexity services. And we're also looking at uh, schools of, um, of three different levels, high schools, uh, primary schools and nursery schools. We are calculating accessibility by walking, by cycling, and by public transport. And maybe in the near future, we might be able to get some data with uh, congestion levels and or maybe from Uber or Waze or TomTom, we don't know. We might be able to analyze and uh, uh, accessibility estimates by cars as well. So this is in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in our plans. So, when we started, this was the first year we started in 2019, and we wanted to start slow, but we also wanted to have some impact and draw and bring attention to the project. So we decided to do the 20 largest cities in Brazil. Uh, for seven cities you see on the top of my screen, uh, on your screen, uh, we were able to get data on public transport systems. So using GPFS data, I'll be talking a bit about this later. And for, for every city that we were, we were able to get, uh, our hands on their GTFS data, we included them in the project. Uh, this included uh, the seven cities. Uh, for this year, we might be including two or three more cities. Uh, you can imagine there is a, a big, big hassle in, in, the, in the project where we have to contact municipalities individually, talk to mayors or, or, or local transport authorities, trying to convince them to share their GTFS data openly available, uh, publicly, make them openly available, or if not, at least send us the data, we'll keep them so safe in our servers and we'll, we'll run the data analysis. Uh, we have encountered sometimes some trouble in the sense that quite a few cities uh, have never heard of GTFS. So we talked to their transport, local transport authorities and they are still organizing the data of their public transport systems using spreadsheets and shape files uh, new, in, like in a very old fashioned way, so to speak. So to do this, we combine, we do like a, what people like to say, like a data fusion. We bring administrative records from the federal government, from the Ministry of Finance, the, uh, our Brazil, uh, SUS, which is the Brazil's equivalent to the NHS in the UK, our public health system, the school census, and the most hard data to get our hands on is the GTFS data. So for those who are not familiar with this, GTFS stands for Global Transit Feed Specification. 
GTFS is basically a standardized data format to how you organize your information for your public transport system. It was created in the mid 2000s by Google and Portland Transport Authority. And it, since then it has, became, it has become the default data format used widely across hundreds if not thousands of cities across the globe. And because it is such a simple and standardized way of organizing your data, uh, it becomes very easy to develop new tools for data analysis and data visualization that you develop maybe to solve your problem in one city, but then another person on the other side of the globe can use your, the, the tool as well. And so we leverage a lot on the new uh, uh, computational developments for data analysis that have been developed on top of these new pl uh, platforms uh, that, are, uh, that are becoming ubiquitous like GTFS and OpenStreetMaps. Uh, we also combine this information with household uh, uh, surveys, including population census, uh, satellite imagery data from NASA, where we get uh, the information on topography of the city, as we know that topography might be very relevant for uh, when you decide the route that a pedestrian or a cyclist should take, for example. And obviously we use uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, which has a relatively good coverage for the largest cities in the zone. So how we, how we do this, how we combine all this data and get the information we need. So basically we have to divide for computational purposes, we divide the city in a hexagonal grid. We are using H3 uh, Uber uh, spatial index uh, at a fairly high spatial resolution of 350 meters with the short diagonal. And basically what we need to do is to calculate how long would it take for you to travel for each hexagon to every other hexagon in the city. So we basically have to calculate this travel time matrices by walking, by cycling, and by public transport during peak and off peak multiple times, especially for public transport because uh, the level of service might vary along, along, across, along the day. So we use uh, uh, various departure times during peak and off peak, <coughs> pardon. So to do this, we use OpenTree Planner, which is a Java-based uh, routing engine developed by the team at Conveo, one of the most uh, cutting edge and, and, and widely used uh, routing engines for this kind of analysis. Uh, we combined it with Python and with R to do the magic. Uh, and basically for each year, we have over 1.6 uh, billion queries of, of origin destination pairs we have to do. So this is something that you could possibly do using Google Maps API. And Google Maps will tell you, you you leave from the centroid of your first origin hexagon, you walk along the sidewalk, you wait for the, this, this bus number X20, and with, the bus will arrive in five minutes, and then you hop on the bus, you go around this route, you hop off the bus, and then you walk the, the last mile to get to your destination. So it, it, it gives us door-to-door -door estimates of travel time in a very realistic way that accounts for waiting for the vehicle, walking times, uh, network distances, uh, bus transfers, and, and so on and so forth. The only problem is that we wouldn't be able to do this uh, with, with Google Maps API because of the, the sheer amount of data that we have to deal with. So by combining this open source um, software and code, we can do this in our own servers. And uh, we, we managed to tweak our Python scripts to call OpenTrip Planner in parallel. So we are, we are, we are running this 1.6 billion queries in OpenTrip Planner in less than uh, 27 hours. Uh, so what kind of results do we get out of this? So we know where people live. We know how schools and hospitals and jobs are distributed across space. And we know how long it takes you from go from place A to place B. And in the literature on, on transport geography, there are hundreds, if, dozens, if not hundreds of accessibility indicators on how you can measure accessibility. Because we were well, like in the early stages of the project and we really want to have ultimately a, an important impact on transport policy in Brazil, we started using it only two accessibility metrics, which are the most simple accessibility metrics to calculate but they, are also they also have the advantage of being the most easy to communicate with policymakers for, to engage with them um, uh, with the results. So the first one is the travel time to the closest facility. In the map you see in front of you, you're seeing the city of Rio de Janeiro. On the top map, you see the travel time to the closest healthcare facility of medium complexity. 
and the bottom you see the travel time to the uh, healthcare facility of high complexity services. <coughs> so the, 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 the places uh, colored in yellow are places from where a person would take less than five minutes to uh, walk or take the public transport and reach the closest uh, hospital. In green, you have something between 10 and 20 minutes. And in dark blue, you have over 30 minutes. So basically what, it, it's, it's a very simple map, like people have been doing this kind of map for decades now. But I think it's fascinating that every time we show a map like this to the local transport authority or to a mayor in Brazil, they immediately recognize what the map is telling them. And you can very easily and quickly spot the places where you have uh, very good uh, accessibility to healthcare services and this very dark, lo uh, large and dark areas where we, which we called uh, uh, opportunity deserts, places which are not served by public, uh, uh, hosp public hospitals, uh, but they are also not served by public transport that connect them directly or easily uh, to those services. Uh, the second indicator that we, we calculate is what is known in the literature as the cumulative opportunity metric. <coughs> and it gave, a, it gave us a result that is something like this. So this is the city of Sao Paulo, uh, the largest city in Brazil. And on the left hand side, you see the proportion of jobs that a person could reach under 60 minutes by walking and taking public transport. On the right hand side, you have a similar map for the primary schools. But let's focus on the jobs uh, for now. The one thing you notice uh, in this map is that this map is not so much about the spatial distribution of jobs. It is about the interaction of how the jobs are distributed in the city and how the public transport network is connected both in terms of space and time and how it increases the capillarity of access to those jobs that are concentrated in the city center. So for, for those who are familiar with the city of Sao Paulo, very easily you look at a map like this and you can see the, the large capacity transport corridors, uh, the subway lines, the train lines, the, the bus corridors, and even you see some uh, bright, uh, bright points, bright dots. So those are bus stations, oh, sorry, uh, BRT, BRT stations, subway stations, or train stations. Uh, the far east side of the city of Sao Paulo is, is a famous part of, of, of town for, for being uh, economically deprived. And you have a large, high dense, large population living in high density in deprived economic conditions with very low, very, very few uh, jobs in the region. However, even in a very dark uh, area like this, where you have very low level of access to opportunities, you can see some bright uh, spots. So this bright spot you see here is actually a subway station. <coughs> and I think it illustrates very well how, even if you, how a, a, the transportation network can be very effective in connecting people to opportunities, even in those economically deprived neighborhoods, which are so, so far away from the city center, and where, where most of the job opportunities are concentrated. Uh, so ultimately, I think what these two uh, maps uh, tell us in different ways is about the importance of looking at the spatial and temporal connectivity of public transport uh, to look at how uh, the access to different services, uh, public services like schools, hospitals, and even economic opportunities is so unevenly distributed across the city but how to some extent the public transport network helps connect people to those uh, opportunities and reduce those inequalities and in access to opportunities. And these maps that I, that I showed you are only looking at the spatial distribution of, of opportunities or the uh, spatial inequality in access to opportunities. But we are very much uh, focused on other dimensions in the inequalities in access to opportunities, including by race and social uh, and, and social and economic status. Um, so I'll very briefly mention uh, this chart that we did uh, where we calculated what we called what is known as the Palma ratio. So imagine that for every city, we calculated the number of jobs that a person can reach just by walking within 30 minutes. So you, you, you leave your home, you have a 30 minutes radius to walk around your, the place where you live, your neighborhood, and how many, how many jobs you could reach just by walking 30 minutes. We calculate the average job accessibility for the 10th 
10% richest population and the 40% poorest population, we divide one by the other. And this is the Palma ratio. The number you get there is appalling in the sense that every city in Brazil has a systematic inequality where wealthier, wealthier families have much higher levels of access to job opportunities than the poor uh, individuals. In the city of Sao Paulo, where you have the highest value, you have a number of 9.5. This means that the wealthiest population in the city of Sao Paulo can reach 9.5 more jobs by walking in 30 minutes than the poorest population. Even in the city which, uh, that has the lowest level of inequality in, the, in our sample of 20 cities, which is the city of Masayo at the bottom of the, of the chart, you still have the richest population reach, reaching at least 70% as more, uh, more jobs than the poorest part of, uh, of the population. Uh, I could go on and on talking for hours about the project. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we calculated this accessibility, this two accessibility metrics by walking, by cycling, and by public transport mode for 20 cities, for jobs, for schools of three different levels, and for hospitals of three different levels. So the, the possible combination of all the analysis that one could do with this data is just immense. We could stay hours just talking about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't torture you with, with, with this, uh, but if some of you might be interested, I would uh, highly encourage you to have a look at our website, the uh, written in the, in the screen in front of you. On the website of the project, you can download the publications uh, that we're, uh, we have for the project, some in Portuguese, some in English. You can download the data set that we developed. Uh, they're all uh, available in geo-package format, so one could easily read it and analyze it in R, uh, Python, QGIS, ArcGIS, uh, your, your tool of preference. <coughs> we also have a very nice uh, interactive uh, data visualization tool we developed to so people can choose the city, the transport mode, the activity. Then you, could, you can zoom in and zoom out in the, in the neighborhood, uh, check how your neighborhood compares to other places in the city and so on. Uh, the interactive uh, app was built on using Shiny in R and we are using uh, DECGL. I know you, you've had a nice uh, presentation a few uh, weeks ago about DECGL. Uh, so we are using DECGL to do this uh, via R. And uh, in the website, you can also have more information about the methods that we use. Obviously, I, I wouldn't have time to go into detail here. Uh, and, and all the scripts that we use, both the Python scripts and the R scripts to generate the data, process the data, clean the data, and uh, run the uh, data analysis and uh, visualizations are all publicly available on GitHub. And you can, you can find all of this uh, in the website of the project. Uh, so what are the next steps for this project uh, before, I, I, before I move to the next section of my presentation? So the, obviously we would love to include other urban areas, expand our sample of, from 20 maybe to the 30 largest cities of Brazil. We would love to include more cities with public transport networks uh, in, in our sample. We are also planning to expand the project to include other activities, let's say access to green areas, access to libraries or, or cinemas or theaters, um, access to uh, uh, different types of, of activities that we're, uh, we're thinking about. We would love to include other transport modes, mostly cars. So we would need to have information on uh, the real speed in along uh, roads uh, from, from uh, GPS, or mobile phones to have an accurate representation of congestion levels and how congestion levels affect accessibility by cars. Uh, we are doing some international comparative studies. So we have a new paper coming out with David Levinson uh, and, and I don't know how many other co-authors. We are comparing accessibility to jobs across over 117 or 115 cities in the globe. So this paper is, uh, is probably in print now. We are expecting the paper to come out soon. And we're planning to do some other compar international comparative studies as well. Uh, we are in, in a close and gate collaboration with the Ministry of Cities in Brazil to conduct some impact assessment of transportation projects that they have already funded and that are, that are operational. So we will be doing some ex post evaluation to see 
how those projects have already impacted people's access to opportunities, and most importantly, who benefited from those, uh, from those investments, uh, white wealthy neighborhoods or poor neighborhoods and so on. <coughs> but they also want us to look at transportation projects which are, which are still just on the paper. And I think this is one of the most exciting parts. So we can actually have the technical report of a transportation project or transportation investment, how the project will look like, how it will operate, and we can very easily with the methods that we use anticipate what will be the future accessibility impacts of the project and who will likely benefit from them. So we are also doing this kind of project uh, with the ministry. Uh, one thing that is, I find it, the next uh, point is trying to draw some causal links between accessibility levels and the social, economic and health outcomes of families. Uh, I think this is probably the most challenging part but also the uh, the, the type of research question that has the capability or the, the largest potential to bring out uh, new evidence and improve uh, 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 our social economic policies. It is, so our geographers in general, we are very much strict in thinking about the methods and the data analysis and how we will represent, how data represents the world and, and critically thinking what, what, are, what are we missing? What are the blind spots? But we are not very good at looking for the causal links. I mean, compared to ec economists, for example. So I've, I've had some economists colleagues who they really don't pay much attention about the, the transport modeling and how accessibility is measured. Sometimes they, they, they use Euclidean distance to the city center and that, that's enough for them. However, they are, very, they are much more uh, careful in trying and, and, and yeah, they're much more careful in trying to draw and find what are the causal links between phenomena. And I think this, this is something that should, be, uh, that should be pursued in the collaboration between econo economists, geographers, social scientists in general, and trying to understand uh, how accessibility conditions actually affect people's socioeconomic and health outcomes. Do people that live in uh, higher accessibility areas can they bounce back into the labor market after an economic crisis? Uh, how they, could they more easily bounce back into the economic market after an economic crisis? Uh, can, they, uh, can kids perform better in school because they live close to school? Or, or maybe families will, will have a higher probability of vaccinating their kids if they live close to a healthcare facility and so on. And I think there are a lot of uh, space to and potential of of research questions around, around these lines. Uh, finally, there are some, quite a few other research papers that we are developing and trying to look at different methods and concepts that we're trying to do. Uh, I will only highlight one of them, which is this study that we did with Antonio Pais and McMaster in, in Canada, where we look at geographic access to COVID-19 healthcare in those 20 cities. And I think what's one of the fascinating things about this project is that uh, the the COVID pandemic is started, started in Brazil like uh, in early March. And just one month later, in a very short uh, period of time, we were able to uh, analyze and map what are the places where mo the most vulnerable people, uh, people above five, uh, 50 years old and low income, uh, the people who are most dependent on public health care, the people who are most dependent on public transport systems who are basically collapsing in the middle of the pandemic, and people uh, uh, who cannot afford uh, uh, private health care, right? So we are trying to understand and map where are those most vulnerable people, where do they live, and where do they have the, the most difficult time in getting to a, a healthcare facility, either for a basic uh, uh, service or to a, a, a severe case of, of hospitalization where you need ICU, uh, with the support of respiratory uh, equipment, for example, respirators. <clears throat> and in a very short time, in just a month, we were able to map those individuals in the 20 large cities and send the, the study with all those maps to uh, local uh, city officials saying, look, if you want to increase uh, the access uh, to the most vulnerable population in your city uh, to uh, tackle a pandemic uh, like COVID that we're facing now, these are the neighborhoods you should be prioritizing, either by building makeshift hospitals in those places or by sending your, your hospital, your, uh, your staff of local community uh, uh, workers to those places and contacting those people in those places. 
And, and now we, ha we have a, another study that we submitted uh, yesterday where we, we, we have actually found strong evidence that the high, lowest income population and the black communities in Brazil are significantly more likely to be infected, hospitalized, and die from COVID-19. And I think to some extent, the studies that uh, we are trying to do uh, they have some value and they bring some important insights, not only from, for academic purposes, but also for policy decision making. Uh, just wanted to say also in this study on the geographic access to COVID, we are also developing a new, uh, we are employing a, a brand new uh, accessibility indicator that uh, Tony Pai has developed. And I think it can be a very important uh, conceptual and methodological development for accessibility and healthcare analysis. Uh, in the literature. Done. Okay, so I just have maybe four more minutes or five more minutes. Um, the Access to Opportunities project, as you have seen, is, is quite tremendous in the sense that it, it involves a lot of work. We have to do with so many different data sets and so many different data sets with so many different problems and data cleaning is always a hassle. And along this process, uh, we, have tr we have been building tools to facilitate our lives, but because we know that uh, developing software is fun and other people could, could benefit from this. We're also making all the tools we develop uh, publicly available. So I'll very briefly mention these four tools <coughs> that we're developing and I'll close my presentation. The first one is GeoBR or GeoBR, what we say in Portuguese. And this, this is a computational package available both in R and in Python uh, that allows you with, in, with just a few lines of code to access uh, quite a number of official spatial data sets of Brazil. So we have over 23 geographies, uh, municipalities, census tracts, urban footprints, metropolitan regions, disaster risk areas, indigenous lands, uh, geolocated schools in the whole country and so on and so forth. And we have this information for several years. Some of this data set uh, date back to the 1800, late 1800s. Uh, and again, in just a few lines of code, either in R or in Python, and I emphasize Python here because I know Danny uh, will, will be happy about this. You can very easily download any of the data sets in different spatial resolutions and enjoy it. I think it's, uh, it, it's been uh, saving my life uh, and I'm very glad we put this, uh, this uh, package uh, out there. The second package is named R5R. This is, uh, this is the package that we are planning to use for rapid realistic routing with R5 and R. So for now, this, is, this package is only available in R, but if you are into Python and you know a little bit of Java, uh, you might wanna get in touch and, and collaborate. We were, we were, you would be very happy to develop a Python version of this. So basically what this package does is it, it does very, very extremely fast routing on multimodal uh, transportation networks. So it's basically what, it, what OpenStreetMap Planner does, but in a ridiculously more efficient way. So we can easily calculate travel time matrices or travel distance matrices between multiple pairs of origin destinations, or for a given uh, pair or, of origin destination, you can find what are the different alternative routes uh, with very detailed information for every uh, segment of the trip between place A and B. And in some of the first test, tests that we ran, uh, R5 were at least six to sometimes 22 times faster than Open Trip Planner. Uh, I have to say though, the, the war horse behind all of this is actually R5, which is the routing engine developed by this incredible team at Conveo, the same team that developed Open Trip Planner. Uh, and basically what our package does is just uh, to wrap some, some functions that allow us to run R5 locally in your machine. Uh, finally, not finally, but we, along the way, we also developed a, another uh, R package called GTFS to GPS. So some of you will have, uh, will know GTFS data is basically a bunch of text tables with, uh, it's a relational database with a bunch of text tables. And what we do with this package, it's a very simple thing. We convert a, a, a GTFS data from this format to a GPS-like data table. So this function, this package has a lot of different functions to edit, uh, shape, filter, and, and fuse different GTFS datasets. But the core idea or the core aim of this package is basically to move 
from a GTF, GTFS format to a GPS data table. And of course, with a, with a, a data format with, like this, we can do nice, beautiful data visualizations, the ones like the ones you're seeing now. Uh, the fact is that this, this package is not an end in, it, in itself. It was actually a one milestone that we needed to achieve for the next package, which is a new project that we are developing, which is GTFS to emiss. So we are, we, are, we are finishing to develop this new package. We're, it's almost done. And we are creating a new project named uh, Route to Low Emissions, where we use this package to estimate public, public transport emissions from GTFS data. So if you have this, the, the, the spatial coordinate, the spatial and temporal coordinates of, the, of all the vehicles in your public transport fleet, you know where they are, you know what speed they were at, uh, you know what time of the day uh, where they were. Uh, you can combine this information with emission factors that are uh, developed in the lab and on the streets by different uh, labs across the world in different countries. And you can estimate what is the host, hot exhaustion type emission that is coming out of each vehicle. So with this package, we're actually developing a method that estimates public transport emissions bottom up from each vehicle at a very high spatial and temporal resolution of meters and, and minutes. And because GTFS data is a standardized data format across the globe, uh, we, are, we, are, we are aiming to develop a method that is com computationally scalable for uh, hundreds of cities across the globe. Uh, so right now we are finishing to develop this package uh, and we are starting to write a, a new paper where we are trying to bring together uh, GTFS data from different cities across the globe and create an, uh, one of the first international comparisons uh, of public transport emissions, of emissions of different public transport systems in different cities. It looks beautiful, but it has a very important limitation at the moment we, can't, we don't have enough information to estimate uh, transport emissions from rail-based uh, services. So trains, uh, subways, and light rail systems. For now, they are still a blind spot in our method. But if you know how, uh, where to find data that could be used for this, if you'd like to collaborate, we are very much uh, happy to hear from you. Uh, this was all I had to say. So I took about 40 minutes uh, in my presentation, as I promised. Uh, I hope it was not such a long torture. I just wanted to thank uh, all the collaborators in, in, in my team and in, in other universities and institutions. The, the project that I presented today is not something that a person can, can do on its own. And I'm very, very fortunate and honored to have so many uh, brilliant uh, uh, research assistants, collaborators, and, and other uh, people in, in Brazil and, and across the globe collaborating with this. And that's it. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a really great presentation and it's very informative. And I can see <laughs> the applause, the applause signs. Um, so uh, if anyone have any questions, please um, put that in the chat box or please, please um, jump in to ask questions directly. So uh, firstly, I have a question about um, the access to jobs. So I just wondering how you define the access to jobs. Is that travel time to some major job centers in the cities, or you have figured some ways to find out um, the job distributions across the city region? Yeah, uh, I, now that you asked this question, I realized that I should have mentioned this. Uh, so all the, the data sets that we were talking about, the administrative records on uh, employment, schools and hospitals, we geolocate those information. So we have the address of companies, the address of schools and hospitals, and we go through a long and torturing process of geolocating these data sets with, uh, with the data set that we have at IPEA, but also using some uh, support from Google Maps API. And so we know, we know the exact uh, spatial coordinates of where jobs are, and we know travel times and we can connect the dots. Uh, another question is regarding the uh, peak hour. I, I assume that there might be some difference in the travel time during the peak hour and off peak hours. So um, has this been um, considered in presenting this kind of resource of different kind of access to different services? 
Yeah, so it, it, the, the difference between peak time and off peak time is very, very relevant. So actually, it's funny because in, in geography, we are very familiar with the concept of the spatial modifiable area unit problem. Uh, the modifiable area unit problem, which is the MOP problem. Uh, but we are not so much, there, there, there is a, the temporal equivalent, which is the temporal, uh, the temporal unit, the modifiable temporal unit problem, the m -tub. And the, just as in the, mal, the spatial modifiable uh, area unit problem, you have different scales and, and geographic schemes affecting or influencing the conclusion of your study. In the m -tub, you have this, the, the equivalent with time. So depending on the, the departure time that you use for accessibility analysis, the results might change. If you're departing uh, during peak or off peak, if you're departing on a weekday or, or on a weekend, your, uh, your results might affect. There are also diff other different um, uh, temporal dimensions that affect your results. So for example, if you're calculating accessibility, let's say how many jobs you can reach within 30 minutes or how many jobs can you reach within 90 minutes or one hour. The choice of the, the, the time threshold that you use will also affect the conclusions, can also affect the conclusions of your study. Uh, there are uh, different aspects as well. Uh, let's say you try to minimize this issue, right? So let's say I want to calculate uh, multiple departure times between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Why not, so the time, so not only the position of the window, like starting at 11 a.m. or 2 p.m. matters, but also the size of the time window matters. So we have at least three different temporal dimensions in your methodology that could ultimately influence the analysis. Um, we try to account for some of them. So in the, in the project, we calculate accessibility using different time thresholds, and we calculate accessibility uh, using multiple departure times during peak and off peak. <laughs> and the, the data set that we put out there uh, can be analyzed taking these uh, things into account. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's those my problems. Um, I think our next one goes to uh, Danny. So Dan, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Rafa. That was a fantastic talk and super, super cool um, projects. I had a couple of, well, one, well, two questions. One, it was whether you could comment a little bit on the amount of sort of hidden burden that releasing packages like you've done on, under this project um, has in terms of the progress of research and in terms of uh, developer time. Because in my experience, it's a fairly uh, unrewarded task that everyone notices when it fails, but when it runs and everything's great, nobody realizes that there's a ton of effort going behind the scenes to make sure that uh, the data are available, that you know the server is not down, and and so on. So, and also particularly in in the context of your some of your packages, where it's not only code that you're distributing, it's, it's access to data sets that needs to be up all the time, and and so on. So that's one. And then the second one, I was wondering whether you could comment a little bit more on what's your view on, or was the from your point of view, was the way forward in terms of scaling these type of projects that at larger scale. So even you said that just to get to, well, just to get to a project like the one you presented with say 20 cities, you pretty much had to go city by city talking uh, transport engineer by transport engineer. And I mean, that's amazing once it's done, but if say to get to your vision of, you know, global map of accessibility, for example, what do you think are the main roadblocks right now and and do you have any ideally any solutions or any any um any ways forward um and i'm thinking not only about transport information but things like jobs for example is in, incredibly hard to measure say comparably across countries even harder if it's at high spatial resolution etc so i mean i guess i suppose you won't have a, a definitive answer but i'd love to pick your brains and on what the ways forward are in, on these areas. And again, yeah. thanks very much, it was a really cool talk. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your questions, Danny. It's always, uh, always $1 million questions, right? Uh, so the, fir the first question, I think it's easier to respond. And, and I, I totally agree with you that developing packages 
is it's not something that it's very glamorous. You don't get so much recognition, uh, despite of the impact you do, right? Like, so if you, if you sum up all the packages that we've developed now, uh, we have over, over 20,000 downloads, which is very little, right? very few downloads if you compare to uh, major packages like Deplier, Data Table, or you know, OSMNX uh, from JoffPoint. We are very like the very early stages of our packages, but 20,000 downloads is, is probably much more than I would ever have in citations from all the papers that I published in my entire academic career, right? So it's kind of interesting to see how this uh, academic publishing and, and, and software development for people who will be using our software for academic publishing, they are valued in very different ways. And I think it's a, I think it's a shame uh, that uh, people who are developing open source tools and making those tools available for other people, um, I think it's a shame that this work is not being recognized as much as, as it should. I think it would be nice to have uh, more uh, attention given to uh, recognition to this, including with citations. Like if you use the package, you, you should probably cite the package. But then sometimes in, a, in the same project, you use like 50 packages and then you might have like a very long uh, reference list and editors might not be very happy with that. Um, so the second, this, your second question is, uh, what are the main roadblocks to scale up uh, projects like this? And data availability is by far the roadblock. It's not about uh, individuals' capabilities, it's not about technology, computational capacity. It's not about data availability. Uh, in some cases, we can overcome this relatively easily. So for example, we have at least three or four different platforms that develop high spatial resolution population estimates across the globe. Like people from Southampton, World Pop, people at uh, uh, CSN uh, in, in Colombia with NASA, amazing project. So we're covered with that. Although those data sets, they largely lack socioeconomic information, social demographics, which is a shame. But uh, in most countries, or at least in middle income and high income countries, you can overcome this with census data. Uh, I really doubt this kind of gap in the data can be overcome with uh, mobile phones uh, and Twitter, uh, like geotag Twitter, uh, but that's a topic for another discussion. And, and by far, like OpenStreetMap is globally available. I think the, the other roadblock for sure is GTFS data. And in the case of Brazil, it, was, it is a big hassle because we have to go from city to city and talk to them because most of them have never heard of it. But if you go to places like uh, in Canada or in the United States or Germany, Sweden, you have GTFS publicly available like in just a few clicks away, right? The hard challenge is probably when you go to countries in Latin America, um, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And these are the places where every time I talk to people in those places, they always say like, how can I do this? And it's really, really, virtually impossible. We have like amazing initiatives from people like uh, Jackie Klopp and people from Colombia, MIT, and other places in Africa and South Africa. They are using uh, volunteer work and GPS trackers to map informal public transport systems like the Matatus project. And this is just an amazing effort, but I think it's also very hard to scale up to different cities. Uh, but I would say at least for, in cases like this where we don't have the public transport network information, just walking and cycling estimates of accessibility would already be a good start. That's already easy to do just with OpenStreetMap data, the data we have of it. And I think we should probably start there first. And from an institutional point of view, demand more and more from local transport authorities that those data become publicly available. That's what we are trying to do, but not sure if we're being super successful at the moment. I just got a message there. I think Juan Tron's microphone cut out, so I'll jump in here. Um, just to follow up on some of the questions in the chat. So Diego is asking, you had the GTFS at the same time period for all the seven cities, or are you, is it like a balanced panel, or do you have kind of gaps in which cities have what years? 
Yeah, that's, that's, I never got this question before. And it's a very, very good question, to be honest. Because when we ran the analysis in 2019, we had the GTFS data of all cities centered in October 2019. So we were analyzing the transport conditions in 2019. However, the population data that we have from the latest census from 2010, job information that we had was from 2017, three years later, uh, uh, two years before, and then schools and jobs were, were from 2018. So we had a, a temporal mismatch of data sources. And what we are doing this year is precisely to fix it. So now we are calculating accessibility for 2018 using all data sets centered in 2018 jobs, schools, hospitals, and public transport centered in October 2018. Population data, however, is still based on the 2010 census because there is no real alternative. Uh, but then from, from this year on, we are planning to, to uh, run this analysis, always looking at one or two years uh, back, but making sure that both employment, healthcare, and school data and public transport data are all on the same year. So we are trying to fix this to follow mismatch. And I just have to say, like the mo the most, like the the motivation that led us to do this was the pandemic. Like we 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 the public transport systems that we have operating today have been severely affected by the pandemic. So it would make no sense if we calculated accessibility with the current public transport system, but with jobs from two years ago. Uh, so we we decided to take the, take this step back, and we are now aligning the the temporal uh, set of the of the data that we're using. And so were you able to get kind of like monthly estimates over the pandemic period or is this kind of aggregates? So how granular can you get with the pandemic, or, you know, across the so in, in, or months? In theory, we could get this very granular like every month. In practice, we know that most transport agencies, they do not update their GDFS data uh, very quickly. They're not very, and especially in a context like this, where so many of, so much of the bus services are being cut back. They're not very happy about updating their data and public, putting them publicly available. So they're not very transparent. So in theory, we would, we would be able to do that on a monthly basis, but in practice, I think it's, I would be very doubtful about the results. So we are only looking for 2020, will we only be looking at accessibility in mid uh, October, November. And do you have kind of the granular equivalent change in the job lists in the employment landscape? Because I imagine there was kind of big changes. We would have uh, for like total number of jobs and by sector, but we wouldn't have it like in uh, geolocated, uh, geolocated data for jobs in a, in a granular way, unfortunately. Uh, well, I mean, one thing that people could do, and I think this might uh, uh, touch back again on, on Danny's question, uh, there have been people developing new methods of, for using uh, night lights, nighttime satellite imagery data to estimate a proxy for economic activity. So I would love to see to what extent this proxy using nighttime satellite imagery is to what extent this is a good proxy for the spatial distribution of jobs. Like it is a good proxy for economic activity and GDP and economic development and social conditions. But at a granular level, does this, match, does this data match the spatial distribution of jobs? We don't know. And I would love to see something like this because if this, if this piece of the puzzle is solved, then we can have very good uh, reliable estimates of spatial distribution of jobs at a high spatial resolution for the entire globe. So if, if, if you're looking for a project for your PhD or master's degree, this could possibly be a good research question. There's kind of a related question in the chat from um, Sindile about, you know, the question jobs, what would be, you know, can you use zonal aggregates essentially? Um, Cause I assume, you know, for Brazil, you have kind of the consistent or, you know, you have census tract coverage for the different cities. So have you looked at, in, you know, what would be kind of the <coughs> bias or the measurement error if you were to use the zonal aggregates? Yeah, so the thing is the data, the, the jobs data, deployment data we have, uh, 
it is point data. So we have the exact uh, address, the full address of the company, and we have the geolocated point where that company is located. So in theory, we could aggregate the data in different uh, scales and zoning schemes. We, we opted for using uh, uh, H3 Uber, uh, H3 Uber uh, hexagon uh, spatial scheme for different reasons. I mean, hexagons are nice. They make nice, beautiful maps. I know this is a, this is the kind of answer uh, Danny would, would, would expect. Uh, but then you will also know, like many of you, that uh, using hexagons have many advantages from a, a statistical and ecological point of view. So we are using uh, hexagons mostly because of this and because the maps look nice. And because the hexagons in H3, you can work with different scales and uh, like those Russian dolls. So you can re-aggregate in different scales uh, in different ways. And it also accounts for, like in, in, the, like in the UK, we have areas in Brazil which have very low density. So the census tract polygons will be very large. Uh, even though the population in that uh, census tract might, might occupy a very tiny portion of that uh, polygon. So we are actually combining uh, hex the H3 hexagons with census tract information and satellite imagery from, from the, the Brazilian Statistics Office, the equivalent of ONS in the UK, uh, to have a very granular spatial distribution of population and overcome um, uh, aggregation schemes uh, in precisions. Um, do, did I answer the question? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, the point I was thinking is that, you know, zonal level statistics are going to be kind of the standard across all the countries, right? So you're probably in a very lucky position where you have the geo referenced points that you can kind of aggregate off. And so, if, you know, thinking about extending this further, do you think that? many different, you know, outside of Brazil, if you're trying to kind of replicate this in other areas, you might be constrained by using zonal job numbers or kind of census data statistics where you don't have this point and you can't kind of create your own hexagons. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I, I would still prefer using the hexagons than using census tracts, for example, just because because you have a more regular, a regular spatial grid that allows you to capture spatial differences in a more precise way, avoiding issues with high density and low density areas. But I agree, like you, using hexagons is arbitrary. You could use regular raster grids, for example. And I'm, 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 I'm happy if other people would like to do that, but we had to choose one. <laughs> we had to choose one spatial aggregation. I'm a big fan of the H3 geometries. I use them a lot. So I think they they kind of overcome a lot of these limitations as well. Um, one point um, Francisco mentioned in the chat, there's a study. Um, so you might want to check the chat afterwards because he makes a link yeah. to a study between uh, nighttime and economic activity. Nice. Yeah, I, I didn't know this paper, Francisco. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Uh, I didn't know this. Um, it is definitely worth having a look at it. And, and also, Understanding to what extent the kind of analysis they do, is it, is this something that you, is valid for different contexts, right? If you're doing this, maybe if you do this in the United States, it might work well. But if you're doing this in Southeast Asia or in a periphery small town in Brazil or in Sub-Saharan Africa, the results might not be that great. Uh, but I, I think it's a fascinating topic. I think it's still worth it uh, of a master's degree dissertation or a few more papers in, in the literature for sure. And Alessia? Yes, if I can just jump in. I wanted to echo Dani first thanking Rafael. That was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And um, yeah, I just have a question uh, about the way you um, conceptualize accessibility uh, through public transportation particularly. And if you included or plan to include information about costs um, in the um, in, the, in relation to accessibility, just thinking of some transit mode, particularly faster transit mode might be more expensive than, than others. And if you, um, yeah, if you include that information in your studies. Um, yeah. And yeah, so. Uh, no, that's, really that's a great question. And I'm, I'm very happy you raised this because uh, there is actually a member of our team, uh, Daniel, uh, he's doing a master's degree in transport studies. I'm co-supervised 
I'm, I'm co-supervisor of the work he's doing. And he's developing a, applying a method of including uh, monetary costs into accessibility analysis. So there are many different ways you could do this. Some people use, uh, they convert travel time to monetary cost, and then they, they sum the monetary cost with the travel time as a single monetary cost, uh, and they, they use this global utility, utility function. Uh, there, are, there are, however, some other interesting ways of combining monetary costs with travel times without having to convert things into different measures, which I think is more interesting. Uh, anyway, so Daniel is developing a, a, a case study in Brazil where we are, we're looking, we're incorporating monetary costs into accessibility analysis. And we have this very fascinating uh, result, the fact that if you do not account for monetary costs, you're obviously overestimating accessibility. But you're overestimating accessibility mostly for the low income individuals. The consequence of this is that you're basically underestimating inequalities in access to opportunities. And you're actually overlooking one of the most important barriers for low income people to actually use public transport networks, right? So, uh, and, and, and finally, another fascinating result that we get is that uh, there are different ways of combining the monetary costs with travel times. And depending on the time, thresh the time threshold that you use, you can see that certain transport modes contribute more or less to increasing inequality. So in the city of Rio, for example, the subway caters much more to the accessibility needs of the high income people than the low income people. The, the, the railway, on the other hand, is just the opposite. So depending on how you, you, you combine your analysis to look at transport and travel time, so sorry, monetary and travel costs and time costs, uh, your equity analysis of who benefits from the transport network can change in sometimes in ways that are not very intuitive. And I think this is fascinating. And we're, 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 we presented this paper in the Brazilian transport conference this year. Uh, we are wrapping up a new version with more analysis uh, for uh, maybe for TRB or another international conference in the US in 2021. So hopefully we'll have something on this soon. And maybe we might be able to incorporate this analysis into the project as a whole. Because getting GTFS data is already hard. Getting information on public transport fares, sometimes it's even harder. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was about to say that it's also about that data availability. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I do have, have a... another very quick one. Yeah, no, sorry. sorry. Uh, so I have another question about um, probably different ways of presenting this kind of uh, access to opportunities. For example, um, in some uh, UK data, in the GT GTS data, we have some uh, kind of indicators to say, um, how many hospitals is accessible within 15 minutes in this kind of um, in this kind of accessibility measure? So how do you reckon on the other ways of presenting this kind of accessibility to opportunities? For example, um, three hospitals are accessible in 15 minutes, something like that. Is that something that um, the stakeholders will yeah. be interested in? Yes. Uh, so the thing is, uh, when we the kind of measure you're talking about is very much important to think about the resilience of the system because maybe you might want to go to the closest hospital but the closest hospital is busy you have to go to the next one so how resilient is your accessibility to to the healthcare uh, service uh, there are and the, the other thing is this measure of access to the closest facility is very simple and it's very basic and one of the shortcomings of this measure is that it does not take into account competition effects because that hospital might be 10 away, 10 minutes away yeah. from you, but it's also 20 minutes away from everyone else. And everyone else will be using the same hospital and you have a, a busy bottleneck for catering to the needs of people of the population. So there are a family of accessibility indicators called uh, float catchment areas indicators. And there are, there are two, two step float catchment area, three step float catchment area. There are different indicators that take into account the, the travel time to get to the facility, but also the competition of how many people will be reaching the facility and how many facilities are available, available to the population. The problem with this family of flow catchment area indicators is that most of them have some problems of inflation. So some of them will count multiple times the population that will demand service, and some of them will over 
we'll, we'll, multi, we'll, we'll count multiple times the services that are made available to the population. And so you have either a supply or demand inflation. So Antonio Pais last year published uh, with Chris Riggins in Canada, they published a new uh, a paper developing this new method. Uh, and it's, it's quite funny because they, 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 they proposed an indicator that would solve all these issues of inflation and demand and supply, but they didn't name the indicator. I mean, you have to baptize the indicator that you propose. So anyway, so we invited Antonio and we are using this indicator in that paper that I mentioned on access to uh, COVID-19 health, uh, healthcare facility service. And we baptized the indicator as the balanced flow catchment area. And I think this is one type of indicator that will take into account both uh, supply and demand competition. Uh, and it will also uh, address the, the, the issue that you were, you were asking. And I think it, the, the interpretation of the result is always, is always a little bit difficult. Difficult is not as intuitive as the travel time to the closest facility, but it's a very robust indicator uh, uh, from a, a spatial statistics uh, point of view. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, this was my question. Yeah, I have a very, very quick one actually about the tool. Um, so uh, yeah, um, so this this R five R running parallel as well because I'm currently using OTP, and I managed to get uh, that to run in parallel. There's a maximum of ninety threads, which is kind of fine. But yeah, I was just wondering if. Um, yeah, if you can convince me to switch to <laughs> R5R five, five and what are the benefits? That, uh, yeah, so, so uh, OTP had a big barrier for uh, paralyzing OTP. Uh, we, we managed a, a while ago, so I, I, I created this GitHub repository where we have some Python scripts. So we use Python to call OTP in parallel and it, it, it works with batches of, of points and it paralyzes in a way that's very, very efficient. Uh, you might want to have a look. If your code is faster than mine, I would be very happy to have a look at your code. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, R5R also runs in parallel, but in a more native way. So you can just, you, you're basically seamlessly running things in parallel without noticing. It's, and it's, you have to try in R, it's just uh, one line of code to create the, the graph and another line of code uh, to run the travel time matrix. It's just like two lines of code, super simple. Okay. If it's faster, like I've, 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 the feedback we've been having from people is that people are running uh, millions, uh, hundreds of millions of queries and it's fantastically faster than OTP. So you might wanna have a look and drop us a line in GitHub. I just saw that Bob Barr uh, uh, asked, uh, uh, thanks Bob for your question. Uh, Bob asked, have you come across itoworld.com? Yes, uh, I'm a big fan of their work. I follow uh, Craig Taylor on Twitter and it's like, he's probably one of my favorite uh, Twitter people in the world. Like I'm, I'm really a, a huge fan of the, the, the work they do. And, and I also find it fascinating that every now and then uh, Craig and some other people, they, they, made, they make tutorials, or they make some of the code they, they do uh, openly available. Uh, I think, however, the work they do, it's kind of the, this fascinating interface between scientific, rigorous data analysis and artistic data visualization and representation of the world. And to do this sometimes, is, it, this is the kind of project you have to tailor your data analysis and data visualization to that specific case that you're analyzing at that time. So it's very, it, it, sometimes it's hard to get the, the kind of tools they use and scale this to hundreds of cities or uh, at the same time. Although some of them are scalable and, and Craig has shared some amazing, the coral reefs uh, data visualization he did, I think is one of my favorite, where you, you have the spatial temporal uh, network of, of, of vehicles coming out of, uh, out of the city in, in, it's just very fascinating. There are still some time if anyone has questions to hope to bring forward. I had a quick question about um, that plot you showed where it was the, the kind of relative income distribution of what groups were accessible to the jobs. Do you know if the cities differ 
dramatically in terms of, you know, having a central business district with all the income, the highest income people there versus the highest income in the suburbs. Because it looks like you might be capturing kind of like a central transportation network. And if the, you know, the downtown historic core is where all the highest income are located versus the suburb, could be picking that up. Yeah, I, I think it would be nice to look into this. We haven't digged into, into this kind of analysis, looking at the spatial distribution of, of C, CBDs and, and, and socioeconomic classes. Uh, but I think it would be fascinating to look into that. What, one thing that we did, and I think it's a fascinating result, is that when you measure the inequality in access to jobs, and when you compare the inequality in access to schools or hospitals, for example, you see that hospitals and health, uh, hospitals and schools are much better distributed across the city. So the, the access to those services is much more resilient and much, more, much less unequally distributed. And it's, it's not by chance, like, at, just like in the UK, in Brazil, health planning and education planning take some spatial dimension into consideration, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, trying to make sure that those services are more widely distributed across the city to make them more accessible. And as a result of this, we have much lower levels of inequality in access to those uh, basic public services than employment, for example. I think the economics behind the allocation of, of, of public services and jobs are very different, of course, uh, but I still find it fascinating to find this, uh, such a stark difference. Yeah, that is interesting. Oh, there's a question in the chat about the size. What it, hey, yeah, what's the size of your geocoded databases? So uh, you mean the size of the, of the company or the size of the data? So the size of the company, we have companies with five employees to companies with 10,000 employees, let's say, sometimes more. Uh, and the size of the data set, it goes, I don't know, maybe, I can't remember. I, I don't really keep these uh, this numbers, uh, but it was something about like 30 million or 40 million uh, workers. And I don't know how many companies. I, I really don't remember. What we are talking about a few dozens of millions of companies and, and even more dozens of millions of, uh, of uh, workers as well. Uh, schools and hospitals are obviously uh, much smaller data sets. So we have a, a few hundreds of thousands of schools and, 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 and hospitals. So geocoding this like batch of data sometimes is quite complicated. Uh, we, we do a lot of this in, with the data that we have without paying for it. Uh, but a lot of the results that we get out of, it, out of, out of the, our data set is not super precise. So we have to rely on Google uh, API sometimes. And I'm covering that with my credit card at the moment. Uh, but if Google API or here API would like to sponsor the project, we'll be very happy to have you on board. <laughs> I've heard Mapbox uh, could also, is also, uh, Mapbox also has API service, but I think Mapbox is getting out of uh, open source now, right? Any more questions? I have, a, I have another question about um, the travel, the travel time, how they are calculated. For example, um, the accessibility um, by public transport is the walking time from that location to a, let's say, a bus stop or metro stop is also included in the or travel time. Yeah. So the the travel time estimate includes a door to door travel time estimate. So it literally simulates as if a pedestrian would come out of the building or the centroid of the polygon, walk along the road network, uh, let's say to a public transport stop, depending on the time you left your home and depending on the time of the, tr of the, of the public transport schedule, you might arrive at the bus stop right at the same time as the bus, but depending on the frequency of the service level and the time you left your home, you might have to wait 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So it takes waiting time into account. So it takes walking time into account, uh, aggress time into account, waiting time, uh, the time you travel inside the vehicle. If you have to take transfers, it will take into account uh, transfers as well. Uh, and it, there is a, some penalization for every transfer you take, it, it adds a few minutes. And then depending on the, on the, on the schedule of your bus you are in and the, the next bus you have to take, you might have, if, if you miss the next bus, you have to wait for the next one. 
So I would say Open Trip Planner is very robust in delivering a fairly realistic uh, travel time estimates that account for all of these uh, hassles of using public transport in the real world. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. I, I was I was also considering of applying some kind of routing engines in my project. Actually, this will be quite helpful to know that. So, yeah. what what kind of data um, it use? Uh, I I assume that it can be uh, hosted on my own machine, right? Or it has to be some kind of like Google API. So like yeah. So with with Open Trip Planner, you can I think you can run on a web server. But I think we because we are doing so many queries, we we put everything on lo our local uh, server and local machine. So the only thing you need is the OpenStreetMap. It's an OpenStreetMap dataset in PBF, the binary format of OSM, uh, and that's it. Obviously, if you have to do, if you want to do open public transport analysis, you also need uh, GTFS data. Uh, the same requirements apply for R five R. Um, and it's just ridiculously fast. Like in the case of R5, the Conveyo delivers it, puts available a service that you can use uh, web Amazon uh, servers, but you have to pay for them. Uh, basically what we did is to create an R wrapper that allows you to easily run R5 in your local machine with, with no expense. Um, and it should be very simple. Uh, you might wanna have a look at it. I mean, Drop us a line if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. So um, does anyone have fun, some final questions to bring forward? So, so let's just say that and uh, thank you very much Rafa, for this presentation and absolutely we get a lot from this. It is super interesting and uh, very well presented. Give everyone a really good understanding of your work. So thank you very much.